Hey, everybody, what's going on? What's hot? What's hip? What's happening? What is shaking on your Thursday? Dave K, welcome to our little program. I don't know if I've seen you here before. Nice to have you, though. Hamhead is here. Everybody's gathering. It's probably the delicious smell of uh, the Colonel's 11 herbs and spices. And you can see some of that right behind me. Oh, yeah, that's the original recipe right there behind me. And that's a controversy all its own. I am going to tell you tonight about Colonel Harlan Sanders, uh, somebody that many of you from the ads and appearances you may have seen in years past, and of course the sort of reconstitution of him as uh, Daryl Hammond and Norm MacDonald and Jim Gavigan. You might think he's a kindly old gent. I'm going to dispel that notion for you here this evening. Hamhead is here. He is a wonderful gentleman. And Dave K says, I'm quiet. Watch you all the time. Well, Dave, we are glad to have you out in our cheerful chat room. People saying hi to each other, glad handing, uh, giving high fives. Let me see here. We've got 13 people on YouTube, seven on Twitter right now. Um, let's see. Randy says, former executive chef of Hollyhock Hills in the house. And let me tell you something. Hollyhock Hills in Indianapolis was a uh, legendary restaurant. And one of the things it was legendary for was fried chicken. You had some good fried chicken at Hollyhock Hills. So, mm. mm -hmm. good stuff. Good stuff. At any rate, uh, news on our march to 3,000. Now, okay, we're at 2,880, which is great. It's wonderful. I'm very pleased with that. But if you, if, and I've done the math, if you go back to what we had on Monday, which was 2,837, and you add the hours that we've had on the previous three days this week, we should have more than that. We should be over 2,900. I don't know what they're doing. I can't be responsible for their silliness. Brett's Hollywood Show. Brett's Hollywood Show. Many of you in the chat, when I see your avatar, I can't wait to click on it so I can see what you're going to write because it's, <laughs> it's always hilarious. Brett, <laughs> Brett's Hollywood. I legitimately invented field hockey. <laughs> I love the uh, obtuse. I'm a great lover of the obtuse. Let me check this again, because I checked it before the show started. And, uh, it had 2880, and I was not... I mean, I was pleased, but yeah, we're still at 2880. So it's 120 hours away, but we should be in the 2930 to 2940 neighborhood right now, if you add the hours up, which I've done. I can do that kind of math. Well, the Reverend Wild Bill is here. You can't really do a show on Kentucky Fried Chicken without the Reverend. Uh, <laughs> it's laughing. I, I, let's, that's why I love the early Letterman show. They were not afraid to just be just just insanely obtuse for no reason. Lotion in a drawer. Come on, that's just funny. Uh, it's just funny stuff. I'm gonna wait another. A minute 45 seconds, then I'm going to get into the topic. Uh, Delco Chris says, Gino Hamburgers was the first outlet for KFC in the Philly area. I remember when it was called actually Kentucky Fried Chicken. It wasn't called KFC. And they switched to KFC. There was a big youth hockey tournament in my hometown of Carmel, Indiana. Uh... And uh, they ran out of chicken because of all the people. And I remember telling the manager, well, are, are you just FC? Are you just KF now? There's no C. Uh, Reverend Wild Bill, I know how the colonel got his iconic beard and soul patch. Well, I'll, I'll get into that. Don't you worry about that. Geno's, actually. Geno's hamburgers. Um. I'm going to get into all of that. The, the story of uh, Colonel Sanders is actually quite incredible. And <clears throat> in researching him, I found out a bunch of stuff that I did not know 
on his march to becoming the head of this iconic franchise. And not a lot of it is good. <laughs> I, I, it really changed my outlook on uh, the guy. Let's see, I know the barber who did it and got started. Well, maybe you can call in and tell us about that afterwards because I don't have much on that, but, uh, but not right now. Don't blow it. <laughs> hey, uh, let me get my thing open first and then I'll do the dramatic, the dramatic opening of the show. <laughs> that I like to do <laughs> that just sort of pays off uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> the title of this program the let me tell you about part all righty here we go um, so let me tell you hold on let me tell you about Colonel Sanders Colonel Harlan Sanders uh, Harlan David Sanders was born back there in 1890 on September 9th in a four-room house three miles east of Henryville, Indiana. Now, Henryville, Indiana might as well be in Kentucky. It's down there on the Ohio River. It's in deep southern Indiana. And unlike the, the sort of the top two-thirds of Indiana, the southern third is hills and hollers and, you know, rolling forests and things of that nature the upper two-thirds is you could roll a nickel across it because it's just for farmland so he was born in the deep south part of indiana it was the oldest of three children and uh <clears throat> his father had an 80 acre farm which he worked until he broke his leg in a fall and then he worked as a butcher in Henryville, you know, the big city of Henryville for two years. His mother was a very strict Christian woman and a strict parent. And uh, she, you know, warned her kids about the evils of alcohol, tobacco, gambling, and, and whistling on Sundays. So he grew up in a family. Uh, his father died when he was five years old and his mother started working in a tomato cannery and young Harlan was left to cook and look after all of his, you know, three other, uh, two other siblings. So at the age of seven, this is 1897 folks, he was very skilled with bread and uh, vegetables and uh, being able to stretch meat and make it last and make it taste good. And the children actually foraged for food while their mother was away working for days at a time. Her mother, his mother married again when he was nine years old. And uh, that didn't work out well because by a year later, the U.S. Census shows that her husband was dead. She was a widower. And when he was 10, he started working as a farmhand. Now, when he was 12, his mother married again, and they moved to Greenwood, Indiana, which is a southern suburb of Indianapolis today. At the time, it was probably a city that was located anywhere from 20 to 40 miles south of Indianapolis, right there on US 31, Meridian Street through Indianapolis, but at the north and the south, it's a highway. Uh, and... and uh, Colonel Sanders, Harlan Sanders, he did not get along with his stepfather. So at the age of 12, he dropped out of seventh grade. He later said algebra is what drove him off. And he went to live and work on a nearby farm. And he was doing things like he got a job painting horse carriages in Indianapolis. And when he was 14, he moved way back to southern Indiana and worked as a farmhand. So with his mother's approval at the age of 16, he went to a bigger city right on the Ohio River called uh, New Albany, Indiana. That's right across, you know, you cross the river, you're in Kentucky. And his uncle worked for a streetcar company, and he got, at age 16, uh, good old Harlan Sanders got a job as a conductor on the streetcar. Now, this began a lot of sort of railroad and transportation work that uh, Colonel Sanders got into and a lot of other things. But before any of that started, he falsified his age 
and date of birth and enlisted in the United States Army at age 16. And he was what they called a wagoner, which was basically just somebody that drove large teams of horses, which in 1906 was, you know, a good portion of the U.S. Army. And he did that in Cuba, and he got the Cuba Pacification Medal in the Army. He was honorably discharged about a year later, and he moved to Sheffield, Alabama, where his uncle lived. There he met his brother Clarence. They teamed up together, who also moved away to escape this evil stepfather. Now, the uncle that they were living with worked for the Southern Railway, and he got Harlan a job there as a blacksmith's helper in the workshops. And after two months of that, uh, Harlan moved to Jasper, Alabama, where he got cleaning out the ash pans of trains. The ash pans, you know, uh, those are coal-fired uh, trains, so the ashes fell down into these pans, and that's what he did. He cleaned those out on the Northern Alabama Railway, uh, sorry, Railroad. Uh, when they finished their runs, they'd come into the train station, he'd clean out the ash pans. That was his job. He then got promoted to a fireman. Now, fireman on the rails is not somebody that puts out fires. Do I have a picture of him up? Am I just sitting here talking like an idiot? Yes, I am. There he is. And uh, this is a picture of him in 1924. Uh, this is how you guys all know him. That's how everybody knows. I'm sorry for not putting the picture up. A pox upon me for a clumsy lout. Um, and there he is in 1924. I'll keep that up for a while. Because <laughs> old Harlan uh, went through some jobs now. Uh, fireman on the rails was not somebody to put out fires it was somebody that would stoke the steam engine with coal or i suppose some of them could have been wood uh he worked that job for nearly three years until and you'll see this is something that will continue um and this will prove he wasn't this kindly old dude uh <laughs> he was fired for insubordination uh, which who knows what you have to do in, you know, 1906 to get fired for insubordination on a train line, but whatever it was, he did it. He then found laboring work with the Norfolk and Western Railway uh, in 1909. And while working on the railway, uh, he met Josephine King of Jasper, Alabama, and they were married shortly after at the ripe old age of 19 in Jasper, Alabama. Now, that marriage will become important later for another reason that will indicate he wasn't the greatest guy in the world. Uh, they had three children, uh, Margaret, who was born in 1910, and she died in uh, 2001. So she lived until the age of 91 years old. And then he had a son named Harlan Sanders Jr., who died in 1932 in Martinsville, Indiana, which is not a nice place. I can attest to that. And he died from, of all things, and this is such an early 1900s, first half of the century thing to die from. He died from infected tonsils. Yeah. Uh, and then they had a daughter named uh, Mildred who died in uh, September of 2010. She was born in 1919, so she also lived a ripe, ripe, ripe old age. And she died in Jeffersonville, Indiana, which is directly across the river from Louisville. And the Louisville Slugger baseball bats, I think today, are manufactured actually in Jeffersonville, Indiana. So you can see how close those two towns are. He then got work as a fireman again on the Illinois Central Railroad. And he and his family moved to Jackson, Tennessee. And by night, he studied law by correspondence. And uh, he lost his job at the uh, Illinois Central Railroad for... Brawling, brawling with a colleague, fighting, basically. 
while Sanders moved to work for the Rock Island Railroad, the Rock Island Line is a mighty fine line. The Rock Island Line, it's a line to load. Rock Island Line is a rock and roll line. And the Rock Island Line is a line to take a station and I'm going to make it to the Rock Island Line. Anyway, <coughs> it's a popular song of the day. Uh, Josephine and the children, the three kids, went to live with her parents. Now, after a while, he began to practice law in Little Rock, which he did for three years. And after that three years, he had earned enough for the family to move back with him. His legal career ended, though, and hmm, what would be a reason that Harlan Sanders' legal career would end? Hmm, maybe it was after he got in a fight with his own client in a courtroom. Yes, yes, and that destroyed his legal reputation, so he's done being a lawyer now, and that was a really low point for him. Uh, he had repeatedly, you know, had failed at things largely through being really stubborn and bullheaded and no self-control, no patience. And he had this self-righteous lack of diplomacy. He just, he was just full of himself. So following that incident, he was forced to move back in with his mother in Henryville where he went to work as a laborer again, and he's like 25, 26 years old at this time, uh, on the Pennsylvania Railroad. In 1916, the family moved back to Jeffersonville, Indiana, across from Louisville, where he got a job selling life insurance for the Prudential Life Insurance Company, and he was eventually fired. What could he possibly have been fired? Oh, yeah, insubordination. Okay, so he moved to Louisville and got a sales job with the Mutual Benefit Life Insurance Company of New Jersey. Now it's 1920, and he's, he's 30 years old. So he starts his own ferry boat company because he's on the Ohio River between Jeffersonville and Louisville and he went and got funding he was a minority shareholder himself in the company and he was appointed the secretary of the company and this ferry boat was an instantaneous massive success and so two years later you know he took a job as the secretary of the Chamber of Commerce in Columbus Indiana now that's a big deal. And the reason it's a big deal is that his company is right on the Kentucky border. Columbus, Indiana is, is uh, just south of the middle of the state. So he, for some reason, is the head of the Chamber of Commerce in a town 150, 180 miles away. He himself says he wasn't very good at the job, and so he resigned from it about a year later. He cashed in his shares for the ferry boat company for $22,000 at the time, and that's worth about $378,000 today. So a pretty penny. Made some coin doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. And he used this capital to establish a company that manufactured acetylene lamps. And that failed because a company called Delco, which would later become Delco Remy, introduced an electric lamp that it would sell on credit. So you didn't need to have the money for an electric lamp. You could buy it on credit, whereas the acetylene ones you had to pay for. So his company totally failed. And there goes his $378,000. He then moved to Winchester, Kentucky to work as a salesman for the Michelin Tire Company. And he lost his job at age 34 in 1924 when Michelin closed its New Jersey manufacturing plant. Now, by chance, just sheer happenstance, he met the general manager of Standard Oil of Kentucky. Those of you who are older might remember Standard Gas Stations. I think they got bought by Mobile or somebody, but Standard used to be a big gas station concern. And that guy asked him to run a service station 
you know, a gas station that also did repairs in uh, Nicholasville, which is a town in Kentucky. And in 1930, six years later, that station closed as a result of the Great Depression. So again, he's out of work. And, and he's only... 40 years old at this time. Now, in 1930, the Shell Oil Company, you all know Shell, they offered him a, a service station in North Corbin, Kentucky. This is big. This is big. They offered him a service station in North Corbin, Kentucky, and they offered it to him rent-free. The payment for the service station, which, by the way, had a little... Uh, uh, adjoined uh, adjacent uh, living quarters as well. All he had to do was pay them a percentage of the sales. So he got a sweet deal there. Now, this is when Harlan Sanders began to serve chicken dishes and other meals such as country ham and steaks. This is when I will begin re reverting to my Southern Indiana accent when appropriate, not because so much it illustrates the story, but because I just really like doing it. Um, anyway, starts making fried chicken, other chicken dishes, and country ham and steaks. Now, initially, he served the customers. Somebody came in the gas station. They said, hey, I'd like to eat here. And he served them in his own living quarters. He would take them over to his house in the kitchen. He'd make the stuff and bring it out into the living room. And they ate at his house. That's where he did that business. Uh, but then he did open a restaurant there on the service station grounds. And it was during this period, because we're starting to get to the root of something explosively popular here, but it wouldn't be a Harlan Sanders story. It wouldn't be a Colonel Sanders story without something like this. He was involved in a shootout with a guy named Matt Stewart, who was a local competitor over the repainting of a sign directing traffic to his station. So this guy probably had an arrow that said, go to Route 4 and turn right. This guy, you know, repainted the sign so it was to the wrong place. Yeah, yeah. He was in this shootout, and Matt Stewart actually killed a Shell employee who was with Harlan Sanders during the shootout. Matt Stewart is convicted of murder, Ta-da! Colonel Sanders ain't got no more competition in North Corbin, Kentucky. So at around this time, when he was 45 years old, he was commissioned as a Kentucky colonel in 1935 by Kentucky Governor Ruby Laffoon. I'll say that again. Ruby Laffoon. Now, a Kentucky colonel, being commissioned a Kentucky colonel, has absolutely no military designation or responsibilities or authority. It is a totally honorary title. It's a title of some esteem. In Indiana, we have something called the Sagamore of the Wabash. And that's if you've done enough great things for the state, they award you with it. And it is a great honor don't kid yourself. It is. And as is being a Kentucky colonel. But it doesn't, when you hear Kentucky colonel, you think, well, he must have been quite a fighting man. No, that's not what that means. But it is how he got to call himself Colonel Harlan Sanders. Now, his local popularity was growing to the point that in 1939, remember, he's now 49 years old. A food critic whose name you will recognize by the name of Duncan Hines. Name ring a bell? Many of us have seen Duncan Hines on brownie mix, frosting mix, things of that nature. Well, at the time in the United States, Duncan Hines was probably the preeminent food critic in the country. And he had a book that he would publish every year uh, because 
travel on the roadways was very popular. Air travel wasn't a common thing for people. So that when you were traveling, you could see, or you went to a different town or visit relatives or were going to see the great, you know, Grand Canyon or something. You could see in a town what the best place to eat was. Well, he visited Sanders' restaurant and he included it in the book, Adventures in Good Eating. And the entry read, Corbin, Kentucky, Sanders Court and Cafe was the name of it at the time. A very good place to stop en route to Cumberland Falls and the Great Smokies. Continuous 24-hour service. This place was open round the clock. Sizzling steaks, fried chicken, country ham, and hot biscuits. Lunch in 1939 at the Sanders Court and Cafe cost you anywhere from... 60 cents to a dollar. Sorry, 50 cents to a dollar. Dinner was 60 cents to a dollar. So good eats for cheap, I guess, the message there. In July of 1939, he got a motel in Asheville, North Carolina. He just bought it. And his North Corbin, Kentucky restaurant and motel was destroyed in a fire. And he had it rebuilt. But when he had it rebuilt, he had it rebuilt with a very large 140-seat restaurant. Now, by July of 1940, he's 50 years old. He had finalized, totally perfected, his secret recipe for frying chicken, very important here, in a pressure fryer that cooked the chicken faster than pan frying. As the United States entered World War II in December of 1941, gas was severely rationed and tourism dried up and he had to close his Asheville motel. So he went to work as a supervisor in Seattle until the last part of 1942 and he later ran cafeterias for the government at an ordinance works in Tennessee, followed by his job as an assistant cafeteria manager in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So now he's kind of in the restaurant business and has been for some time. Now, remember I told you about Josephine and his wife and how that would become important in showing how he wasn't the greatest guy. He had had a mistress for many years. And I mean many years. And her name was Claudia Liddington Price. And she, uh, you know, worked with him at the North Corbin restaurant and motel. In 1942, uh, he sold the Asheville businesses. And in 1947, now he's 57 years old. And she's like 30-something. She's sufficiently younger than him. He divorces Josephine and he marries Claudia in 1949 at the age of 59 as he had long desired. He had long desired to marry Claudia Liddington Price. So not the greatest guy in the world. Um, He was recommissioned at this time because one isn't enough as a Kentucky colonel in 1950 by his friend, Governor Lawrence Weatherby. Yes, Governor Lauren Weatherby. But then it happened. In 1952, Colonel Harlan Sanders franchised his secret recipe, Kentucky Fried Chicken, for the first time to Pete Hartman of South Salt Lake, Utah, the operator of one of the city's largest restaurants. In the first year of selling this secret process, herbs and spices, pressure fry, the whole thing, the restaurant sales more than tripled, with 75% of the increase coming from the sales of fried chicken only. Now for Harmon, the addition of fried chicken was a way of differentiating his restaurant from competitors in Utah. Uh, That product that was seen to be coming from Kentucky was unique and had this image of Southern hospitality and good home cooking. Well, Don Anderson, a sign painter that was hired by Harmon, coined the name Kentucky Fried Chicken when painting the sign. 
And it wasn't meant to be the restaurant's name. It was meant to be an attribute of the restaurant. You know, you know, uh, delicious steaks, Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know, it was meant to be just a descriptor. After Harmon's success, several other restaurant owners franchised the concept, and they paid Colonel Harlan Sanders four cents a chicken, which is like. 44 cents a chicken in in today's dollars here is by the way that first kentucky fried chicken uh, in uh, south salt lake utah now colonel sanders thought that his north corbin kentucky restaurant would be successful forever but he sold it at the age of 65 after a new interstate highway Highway 75, for those of you that have gone north and south to Florida, um, that reduced customer traffic. Everybody took that highway. They didn't go through Corbin anymore. So now he's left with only his savings and $105 a month, which is about $1,200 a month in today's dollars from Social Security. He, because he, after all, he is 65. Uh, Sanders decided to begin to franchise his chicken concept like as his main focus at that point. And he went all over the U.S. looking for restaurants that he felt were suitable. Now, remember, this is a cantankerous, self-important, know-it-all, will-fight-you-over-nothing guy. So he wasn't just going to a place going, want to do this? And if they said, yes, off he goes. It had to be suitable to him. We'll get to that later too. After closing his North Corbin, Kentucky restaurant, Sanders and his wife, new wife, Claudia, opened a new restaurant and company headquarters in Shelbyville, Kentucky in 1959. And he visited restaurants everywhere. He, he did it by car at age 65 and he would sleep in the back of his car at age 65 and he wouldn't just go in there and pitch him a deal he would actually cook his chicken for them and if the workers liked it at the restaurant he would negotiate franchise rights now these visits were obviously time consuming and they took a lot out of him but the success of what he was doing had potential people begin to visit him instead of him having to go there. So he ran the company from that Shelbyville location while Claudia mixed and shipped the spices to the restaurants. That was her job, mixing and shipping spices. Now, the franchise approach was like super, super successful. Kentucky Fried Chicken was one of the first fast food chains to expand not just in the United States, but to Canada, the UK, Australia, Mexico, Jamaica, all by the mid-1960s. So all within about five years of when he started trying to franchise. He got a patent to protect his method of pressure frying chicken in 1962, and he trademarked the phrase, it's finger licking good in 1963. The rapid expansion of the franchises to about 600 locations was now too much for Harlan Sanders, okay? Uh, in 1964, now he's 73, 74 years old, he sold the Kentucky Fried Chicken Corporation for $2 million, which is worth about $19 million in today's dollars, to a partnership, and this is a little bit <clears throat> important, uh, of Kentucky businessmen headed by John Y. Brown Jr., who was at that time a 29-year-old lawyer, but he would later become the governor of Kentucky, a guy named Jack Massey, who was a venture capitalist and entrepreneur as well. And Sanders became paid to be the ambassador, to be the face of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And that's how most of us know him, is the guy, the kindly old man in the, these commercials. The initial deal that he signed with him didn't include anything in Canada or the UK and a few US states that he had already sold off to other people. 
Now, in 1965, at age 75, he moved to Mississauga, Ontario, a suburb of Toronto, because all of his franchises that he owned were up in Canada, and he continued to collect these franchise fees and appearance fees in the Canadian provinces and the U.S. He bought and lived in a bungalow in Mississauga from 1965 until he died in 1980. But he remained the company's symbol after selling most of his stuff. He he would travel 200,000 miles a year on the company's behalf filming TV commercials and making appearances and he kept a ton of influence over executives and franchisees who respected his culinary expertise and they also feared what the New Yorker magazine because they did an article about him called the force and variety of his swearing when a restaurant or the company varied from what he called the colonel's chicken. That is not the colonel's chicken. Well, this is the colonel's chicken. He was extremely <laughs> obsessive about it. Uh, one of the changes the company made after purchasing the franchise, the you know, whole kit and caboodle from Harlan Sanders was to the gravy. And this was a long standing battle between Harlan Sanders and the people who bought the company because Sanders, when he had the company, said the gravy was so good, it'll make you throw away the dumb chicken and just eat the gravy. He thought it was that good. But the company simplified the gravy because his gravy process, yeah, it was spectacular gravy, but it was costly and it was time consuming. So <laughs> as late as 18, uh, sorry, 1979, a year before he died, Sanders was making surprise visits to KFC restaurants, and if the food disappointed him, he denounced it to the franchisee as goddamn slop, or he would just push it onto the floor. In 1973, he sued the company that bought the, the you know the KFC from him, then the parent company of KFC over alleged misuse of his image in promoting products he has not helped to develop. So if he hadn't made the product himself, he didn't want his image on it. In 1975, they unsuccessfully sued him for libel after he publicly described their gravy as being sludge and wallpaper paste. He and his wife reopened their Shelbyville restaurant as Claudius Sanders, the Colonel's Lady, and they served KFC styled chicken there as part of their full service, full service. That was one of the only thing they made dinner menu and talked about expanding the restaurant into a chain and the company sued him for it. After reaching a settlement with them, he sold the Colonel's Lady's restaurant and it has continued to operate since then, currently as Claudia Sanders Dinner House. And it serves his original recipe fried chicken as part of its non-fast food dinner menu. And it is the only non-KFC restaurant that serves an authorized version of that original recipe. But he, he remained very critical of their food. I mean, super critical of their food. Uh, let's put some more of that up there, man. I loves me some KFC. I really do. Uh, <laughs> he, he talked to the Louisville Courier Journal in 1975 and he told them, my God, that gravy is horrible. They buy tap water for 15 cents to 20 cents to a thousand gallons. And then they mix it with flour and starch and they end up with pure wallpaper paste. And I know wallpaper paste by God because I've seen my mother make it. There's no nutrition in it and they ought not be allowed to sell it. The crispy fried chicken recipe is nothing in the world but a damn fried dough ball stuck on some chicken. <laughs> he's, he's so, just so absolutely hard to get along with. Here's some people that aren't happy. They're wanting it boycotted, but that's that's sort of what KFC looks like today. And I'll just put him up here for the rest of it. That kindly smiling face that we've now all learned is really a hard-headed dude. He was uh, 
after he was recommissioned as a Kentucky colonel in 1950, that's when he began to dress the part of a Kentucky colonel, growing a goatee, wearing the frock coat, string tie, and referring to himself as colonel. His associates went along with it, to sort of jokingly at first, but then when they saw he was super serious, they had to kind of straighten up and act like it was a real thing. He never wore anything else than that getup during the last 20 years of his life. Uh, and he bleached his mustache and goatee to match his white hair. John Y. Brown Jr., former governor of the state of Kentucky, also married Phyllis George of the NFL today, uh, remembered Sanders as a brilliant man with a gourmet flair for food, a visionary and a great motivator with the style of a showman and the discipline of Vince Lombardi. Sanders was a uh, Freemason, by the way. Um, he was diagnosed with acute leukemia in June of 1980, and he died six months later at the age of 90 years old. Uh, he had remained active until the month before his death, appearing all over the place. Um, uh, 1,200 people attended his funeral, which was held at the KFC's headquarters in Louisville, and he was buried in his traditional trademark white suit and black western string tie in the Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville. His wife, Claudia, died on... Uh, New Year's Eve of 1996 at the age of 94 years of age. At the time of his death, there were an estimated 6,000 Kentucky Fried Chicken outlets in 48 countries with $2 billion in sales annually. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was in 1980. So I went over some of the fictionalized um, versions. Uh, they had the cartoon version that was voiced by Randy Quaid. Daryl Hammond did him for a while. Norm McDonald did him for a while. Jim Gaffigan, when they had Extra Crispy. Uh, George Hamilton portrayed him with the trademark tan to indicate it was crispy. Uh, and Rob Lowe was uh, Colonel Sanders for a while. Um, Ray Liotta portrayed Sanders and then Reba McIntyre was Colonel Sanders and Jason Alexander was Colonel Sanders and Peter Weller did a Robocop version of Colonel Sanders um, Sean Austin played a Rudy Rudiger from the movie Rudy version of the Colonel to commemorate the beginning of the NFL season uh yeah, no. A fictionalized version of him was played by Mario Lopez in a short film called A Recipe for Seduction. There's other things in popular fiction and culture. There was a Japanese baseball team that had an urban legend of the curse of the colonel when a statue of the colonel was thrown into the river and lost during a 1980 fan celebration. And subsequently, they didn't win the title for a number of years. And then they finally brought the statue back out and they finally just won the title again in 2023. Um, there was a, a KFC romance novel that was 96 pages long called Tender Wings of Desire for Mother's Day. It was set in Victorian England and it centers on Lady Madeline Parker who must choose between a life of order and a man of passion and Colonel Sanders was her love interest. <laughs> oh, boy. One of his white suits with its string tie was sold at auction in 2013 for $21,000. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's just a lot of stuff. He was a charitable man. He used his stock holdings to create the Colonel Harlan Sanders Charitable Organization, a Canadian organization, and uh, a wing of the Mississauga Hospital for Women and Children's Care is named the Colonel Harlan Sanders Family Care Center in honor of his substantial donation. His uh, foundation has also made big donations to other Canadian children's hospitals. And, uh, you know, he, they distribute money 
uh, half a million dollars a year or so to various other charities. Uh, so he was, at least at the end, he was somewhat charitable and uh, otherwise, he's a cranky old bird. But ladies and gentlemen, regardless of what you thought before, that is the story of Colonel Harlan Sanders. We go now to your comments and I will get him off screen just because I'm afraid he might punch me. I don't like the way you referred to Claudia, you Yankee scallywag. Um, let's see here. Uh, say it's not so. KFC has the best uh, coleslaw ever. You know what I really liked? They had a thing called Little Kernels or something like that. Anyway, I think they still have them. <clears throat> they're, they're like this big. You pull the top off and it's like shortcake, whipped cream, strawberries. In a Man, I, I could eat four or five of those without blinking. Cole's Law, never heard of it. Why'd the chicken cross the road? To escape the clutches of Colonel Holland Sanders. Sandy Eastman says, hi, Tom, I've been busy at work, as you have been. Well, I've been trying, Sandy. I've been trying. But nobody works harder than you do. We all know that. Uh, Randy says, my brother Dale lived in Martinsville. I only went to see him once. Good move, Randy. Randy, I'm. do you know the rumors about Martinsville being a... Martinsville was a major hub for a certain organization that's represented by a letter of the alphabet three times. I will leave that to your fertile imagination. Uh, kind of like Elwood, Indiana. Uh, Rock Island is across the river from me. Well, of course it is. Uh, Tyler Schollenberger, you've got the Quad Cities of Rock Island, Davenport. Uh, don't tell me. I, I used to know all four of them. Rock Island, Davenport. Ah, you'll tell me. Um, oh, I've already done that one. San Houston, or the state of the state. So for some reason, he's the head of the Chamber of Commerce in a town uh yes that's true guy couldn't keep a job they, it's, it's it's the truth terry knee and the reason that he couldn't keep the job is because he got in fights all the time amico yeah jack straw maybe that's who bought standard or maybe who was standard i don't know um my mother used to work in the office here in atlanta for standard oil in accounting they were big corbin kentucky it's corbin with an i I knew the barber of Corbin, Kentucky during that time. Oh, hey now, Reverend Wild Bill. Inside scoop. Um, which guy repainted the sign? Colonel Sanders or his rival? Uh, his rival did. His rival. Colonel Sanders had a sign that said, come, here's the directions to eat at my restaurant. And his rival went and painted over it with different directions. Uh, people saying hi. 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 Uh, let me see here. Gil Mann, it very, very correctly says Duncan Hines was like Yelp back in the day. Everybody respected his opinion from Bowling Green, Kentucky, by the way. I did, I, I did not know that. My parents had friends that lived in Bowling Green, Kentucky. The, the woman had been in nursing school with my mom. And uh, we would go visit them sometimes. And I was super hot for their daughter. Uh it was like in high school. She was she was really cool. Uh, wanted nothing to do with me, of course. Um, people saying hi, people saying hi, people saying hi. Oh, by the way, now's a good time to say you can go to the Tom Gully Show, and there's 270 podcasts there, one of which has to make you very entertained. There's also our store, which has all sorts of merchandise in it, like Terry Knee's coffee mug. That's a 20-ouncer there. And other things you can also get there by going to cafepress.com slash the Tom Gully Show. And if you'd like to donate, of course, we're only at 2880 because, uh, you know, YouTube. Uh, we'd love your donations. Brian Clowder uh, gave uh, a nice donation yesterday. I'm very thankful for that. And I'd be thankful if you did the same thing. PayPal.me slash Tom Gully Show. But really, what we need you to do is like, share, subscribe, retweet. Because that, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't cost you a cent, and it helps me out a lot. And believe it or not, I, 
I got to do work to do this show. Oh, yeah, it's fun. Uh, people saying hi, people saying hi. Hi, 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 hi. Okay, here, Sunday Jenna's is better late than ever. Hi, guys. Oh, hey, guys. Hey, Tom Gully. Hello, Sunday Jenna. Always nice to see you. Nobody's ever late to the Tom Gully Show. Happy birthday, Joker. How old? Joker is 52 years old today. Joker, happy birthday from me and from any everybody else in there. Or is it this weekend and you're celebrating? Somebody in here earlier said it's actually on Sunday. Um, but... Whatever day it is, Joker, I wish you the happiest birthday, and I hope you get another birthday for your birthday. Um, I remember those days. Thanks. Hi. Reverend Wild Bill says, here in Georgia, we have the big chicken in Marietta, Georgia. Can't give directions without using the big chicken as part of it. You just go down to the big chicken, you take a left, and you head on down there to where you see an old combine. It's rusted out, and there's grass growing up around it, but you'll see it. They paint it sometimes. Um, <clears throat> KFC gravy is about 80% polymers these days. <laughs> it's the truth. Because I do remember when that gravy used to be fire. But you know what I like are the chicken littles. You know those sandwiches that got like like th two or three big tenders on them. And then you got mayo and pickle. Ooh, those, those chicken littles are good. And they always got a deal on them. I like that too. And I also like their potato wedges there. I likes me some KFC. And I like getting a bucket. And I like the original recipe, but I also like the extra crispy. I loves me some extra crispy. Um, Joker. Hey, hey. My favorite was Norm McDonald as Colonel Sanders. Yeah, well, it's hard not to like Norm McDonald as anything. Uh, KFC says, keep closing around here. Kind of sad, but I like Popeye's and Chick-fil-A a little better. But is there anything better than a bucket of KFC a couple times a year? No, there's not. And you get them taters, and you get that basket, and you get them uh, tater wedges. Mm. I will say this. Popeye's is a whole different thing, I think. I mean, Popeye's is a spicy, it's a, it's a different thing. Uh, Chick-fil-A, the sandwiches are incredible. I don't stray too much from the sandwiches and the waffle fries. The biggest thing about Chick-fil-A is, uh, where I used to work in Addison, Texas, there was a Chick-fil-A nearby for lunch. They have that um, yogurt with the fruit in it. And then they also, when you're in the drive-thru, the drive-thru line is always long, but it's, you're, you're in and out of there because they're out there with the iPads and stuff. And uh, it, it goes fast. But those sandwiches, but you got to make them give you the mayo. They don't give you the mayo, it's, but, but they're delicious. Absolutely delicious. I, I differentiate those two ref restaurants from, because Kentucky Fried Chicken is a fried chicken place. And so is Chick-fil-A, but Chick-fil-A to me seems to be more of a sandwich place. And they all do tenders now because kids. Blame Canada. <laughs> I love that song. Uh, still a KFC nine miles from me. Good crispy chicken. Mm. And now they got KFC is always attached. You know, you go to a 7-Eleven and there's a KFC and an A&W root beer attached to it or a Taco Bell. KFC and Taco Bell live in harmony. Uh, Doopa Doopa Doo says the chicken is ridiculously big. <laughs> yeah, Karen Garvey, the big chicken, it is ridiculously big. It would be cool to be an honorary colonel if you could walk around wearing a dueling sword. <laughs> it would be cool to be anything if you could walk around with a dueling sword. <clears throat> Reverend Wild Bill will remember when I was doing the show from Utah, People were sending me stuff. I got a speculum. Ladies know what that is. Uh, I got two giant, had to be gallon of, it's like food service size uh, jars of mayonnaise. I got a samurai sword as well. And I got a severed head that I sent to the Rev. Um, Oh, sorry. I love information shows like yours. I'm so glad I found your show. Thanks, TSN. Well, thank you, Gilman. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I don't know what tomorrow's show's about right now. 
uh, ARP, AAA, are those three letters? T- yeah, that those aren't the three letters we're talking about, Wow, Bill, and you, you know what I'm talking about. The phones are not on yet because I'm. I got to get through these chats. Um, Rock Island, Davenport, Moline, and East Moline. Yes, uh, I used to do the advertising for the Quad City Thunder, and there's a gal that lives there. She might still be married. I don't know, but I met her when I lived in Tampa. I worked with her at the time, husband, no longer husband. She is so smoking hot; it's not even funny. But now she lives back in, uh, I think, Rock Island. Um, Mike Myers playing his Scottish father and so I married an axe murderer who had a wild conspiracy theory. I used to hate the colonel with his wee beady eyes. Oh, you're going to love my chicken. <laughs> uh, Aku says, don't know if you mentioned it, but over in Japan, it's a big thing to have KFC for Christmas dinner. Depending on the year, there's a waiting list six to eight months out. Wow. That's crazy. Angry Snowballs says, wow, am I late? What's this about the Colonel and Bill's barber? Well, it's not Bill's barber. Bill is a barber and he knows another barber that uh, launched uh, the Colonel's outfit, which we'll get to here if we have time. Uh, What's up? I don't think there's a Rico tonight. They're all traveling to Jersey or somewhere. Um, Happy birthday, Jenna. I could have called in about the barber, but the phone wasn't on. Well, we'll get to it. it we, we may even get to it at another time, but we'll get to it. Shame. I know. I know. Uh, happy birthday, Joker. I did not realize it was the Joker's birthday, but... Uh, oh, yeah, I did realize it was the Joker's birthday. We got uh, producer Joe in here. Wow, always good to see him around. I, uh, I'm always hoping against hope that one of my quotes gets uh, uh, non super chatted quotes gets posted. I'm like, come on, Joe, read this one, like this one, put it up there. I'm sure Shuley does that or Bob or somebody, but you could do it and they couldn't stop you. Um, is pervitine available at the Tom Gully show? So <laughs> probably not, I guess not anymore. <laughs> No, they put a stop to that, sadly. Uh, thank you, Frog. People saying hi. Uh, Karen Garvey says, Terry Nee, are you acting out because the topic is fried birds? <laughs> Joseph Pruitt says, have you ever thought about going vegan so a few more chickens get to live? Well, Joseph, I'll just, I'll just refer you to that. It, look, if it's not my fault, they're so tasty. If they weren't so tasty, they wouldn't have this problem. Uh, Tyler Schollenberger says Chick-fil-A is making changes to their chicken. Rumor has it due to a supply chain issues, so it may not be so popular. For so long. I doubt that. <clears throat> I, I th- having worked for Tyson Foods, they'll find a way to get you some chicken. Uh, Angry Snowball says my prime minister stole my bank account over a trucking park infraction waiting for release well angry snowballs many of us are waiting for release if you know what i'm saying cindy says kfc hasn't fried their chicken in a decade i want them to bring back the fryers well they pressure cook the chicken uh to my knowledge they pressure cook it that's how the colonel did it anyway Diane O'Brien says, not much of a selection in our KFC UK. Not many restaurants or not much selection on the menu? Because there's not a tremendous selection on the menu here in the United States. Uh, Gilman says, did you ever try the donut chicken sandwich? I have not done that. But I did watch someone eat a McGriddle two weekends ago. And I'm still wondering how you do that. I'm perplexed. Terry Nee says, KF chicken has always been scrawny. Well, I eat it for the breading. I'll be honest with you. Terry Nee, you are one of the birds. I'll also say this. Your grocery store deli has really upped its game with fried chicken. Uh, The one in Utah was spectacular. The crappy Tom Thumb near me here. I don't even go to it anymore. I had it out with them this past week. The rudest employee. But the... um, 
The one in Utah. Ooh, their fried chicken was amazing. Mm -hmm. Terry Nee, you are one of the birds. When will KFC expand into the ostrich market, says Julius Caesar. Waiting for the phones to open. Well, I'm gonna, I'm trying. There's a lot of chats here. These people took the time. Uh, the Chick-fil-A technique is the buttermilk and brine marinade. I've done that at home, works great. That's a thing now you can do. If you want a Big Mac, there's like how to make a Big Mac at home hack. There, there's anything that you like at fast food, there's a YouTube video that shows you how to make the identical thing. It's not always perfectly identical, but a lot of times it is. Um, you can make that at home. You may be crazy. Oh, yes. Reverend Wild Bill remembers all well. Specky the Speculum. I put eyes on him and a mohawk, and he would talk. Hey, Tom, how are you? I got to find Specky. I don't know where he's at. Uh, no kitchen utensil drawer is complete without a speculum, says the code. <laughs> KFC is Yum brand now, China. Well, the Yum brands, that's why they're always with a uh, A&W or a uh, Taco Bell. Those are Yum brands. They used to all be owned by Pepsi, but they broke up for some reason. The Tom Gully Show contributes to tooth decay and equilibrium issues. It's true, Brent. I feel shame. No show on TSN, says the Reverend Wild Bill. Delco Chris is saying hello to the frog. The frog just rocks. I'm sorry, he just does. Terry Nee says, yes, wow, I got a birthday correct. <laughs> Aku says, the size of the chicken is different depending on the city it's located in. I bought a zinger in a major city, and no joke, it was two breasts. You know, that's true, and there's a way, there's a website or something that tells you where the chicken comes from based upon where you live at Kentucky Fried Chicken. There's big producers that that do that. Um, oh, yes, the frog. Tyler Schollenberger says, I'm a proud supporting member of PETA. And by PETA, I mean people eating tasty animals. <laughs> if they weren't so tasty, I wouldn't eat them. Uh, Randy says, say good night, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. Uh, let's see what else we got here. I'm trying to get through these. Let me open the phone lines. I think it was on Instagram, but a direct descendant covers the legend of the colonel and furiously fights that the current recipe isn't what his great uncle made. Okay, I didn't think I was going to have to tell this, but I used to do a ton of freelance for an ad agency uh, that is headquartered out of uh, Louisville, Kentucky called Creative Alliance. And they had sort of, they were a creative alliance. They had littler agencies all over the country, but the big one was in Louisville and they did a bunch of work for KSC. And we were about to do a campaign for them, and they took us to the kitchens of KFC. And while we were there, because we were the hot shots from the ad agency, they took the original recipe and made a small batch of that and prepared it for us. It was so spectacular. And then a discussion amongst the KFC people said, look, when you mass produce this, it just loses something. It's just going to. That We've tried and we've tried and we've tried. There's nothing we can do to mass produce these leaven herbs and spices or whatever uh, and, and make it authentic. It's as close as we can get. And it's still damn good, don't get me wrong. But this specially prepared, oh, oh, mama. Terry Nee says, can't beat a Sam's Club roaster chicken for $4.98. You really can't. Tom Thumb, rude, say it ain't so. It is. It's called Tom Thumb. We got Royal Farms gas steak and chicken. Very good. Yeah, everybody's up their chicken game. JC says, forgot to tell you, I listened to you on the radio Saturday. Very good, Tom. Keep us posted next time you're on there. Did you really listen, Jared? You got to hear me being the news anchor? How does that differentiate from what I do here? Please tell me. I'd, I'd be interested to know. Terry Nee says, can't beat the price of a Stam's Club roaster chicken. Nope, you can't. Up fingers. Yeah, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, PayPal.me slash Tom Gully Show. Man, that would be awesome. I can buy some KFC. Uh, churches always had the biggest breast. Well, uh, <laughs> 
Gilman says, I went to Jamaica 25 years ago. And when someone asked where I was from, KY, the only thing they would respond with is Kentucky Fried Chicken. Oh, hey, Frog. Um, Terry says, you are correct on the Costco roasted chicken. Okay. Sam's Club. Costco is a great thing, too. Hey, Costco, you got to get that. Um, oh, dog on it. It's uh, chili lemon, uh, chili lime. It's green chili and cilantro. It's a cilantro sauce. Oh, God. It comes in the street taco kit, but you can also buy bottles of it. It's oh God, so good. Terry Nee says, it's like a Twinkie. Today's Twinkies don't take anything like the original. You got that right. Uh, I did, bro. That chick isn't as good as you were. I think she smokes a ton of unfiltered cameras. Are you talking about my girl on traffic from the 1080 Traffic Center? She does have a rather sultry voice, doesn't she? But we got to do traffic and weather together on the 8s. You know what I'm saying? Uh, will you be on tomorrow, Tom? I'll be painting. Yes, I will be on tomorrow. Uh, JC, though, but how, how, how does that, is it different than what I do? I think it's kind of different. I think when I'm newscaster guy, I'm more newscastery. Uh, yes, traffic chick. Tom is much better. Well, she's the, tra she's, she's got to cover a lot of stuff and it's complicated too. I, she does all of her stuff on a Google doc. So I get to see her preparing it. Man, oh man. It's complicated, and she doesn't have much time to crank through all that. Mm -hmm. No, she don't. Um, well, here you don't have to hit the post. <clears throat> Technically, I don't have to hit the post there, but I do have to hit network at the top of the hour. Very buttoned up and professional, Tom. I like it. I miss like listening to AM news. Yes, I'm very not casual. I'm casual a little bit sometimes for effect, but most of the time I'm very. Four people were found in a. Yeah, I'm very. You know. Texas Governor Greg Abbott today said that in the future the border will not be. Yeah. I, got to do all that stuff okay i'm look i i'm i know better than to do this but i am going to open up the phone lines because i know the reverend wild bill is chomping at the bit to tell his story and frankly with the amount of support that he has showed this program and with no uh, tsn show in the offing got a little extra time Let's get the Reverend on and let's hear his thing. Uh, JC said, next time, please throw in some New York City news. I did this story about New York just yesterday. They're giving out preloaded uh, debit cards to migrants. Uh, a family of four, including two children, can get up to $350 a week. Giving those out at the Roosevelt Hotel Shelter. Texas Governor Greg Abbott, responsible for many of the migrants being sent from Texas, called that program insane, and rapper 50 Cent openly wondered why hardworking New Yorkers were not getting a break like that. But that's, I did that story just yesterday. What are my final four picks, Gilman asks. Well, Gilman, I will tell you. I will tell you. Hold on. Oh, wow, we've got NCAA going on right now. I forgot about that. It's Thursday. I will tell you that, and then I will tell Bill when the um, when the uh, thingamabob's happening with the whatchamajaggy. Uh -huh. I think I have Iowa State versus Arizona and I have Houston taking on Purdue how am I doing right now anyway Are these games going on hey he's here now games going on let me just see here real real quick okay UConn is leading South Dakota State San Diego State 
So I picked Yukon for that. Excellent. And uh, at halftime, Clemson is beating Arizona, and that is bad news for me because I had Arizona coming out of that. Man, is Arizona one of my Final Four? I think I just said it was, didn't I? I did. I have Arizona in the final, so that would be a bad outcome for me. They're only down by eight, but who knows what will happen. Who knows what's going to happen there? I'm in 39th place, tied with like 15 people, but in uh, the big fancy radio station pool. So those are my final four picks. No comment on the cards. Did I pay my phone? But now look, if you're going to ask a question like that, the phone lines are open. Smarty pants. I've got to open up the software in order to take your call. I don't sit with my Skype open all day. Call me up and tell your story. It's open now. For the love of Mike. Or I'll call you, mister. Don't put it past me. Don't you dare put it past me. I will call you at the drop of a hat. Don't don't you try me. All right. Of course, the first call always screws up on. On uh, what the hey? Speakers muted. Why would that be? As Wild Bill knows, the first call always messes up. What the hell is going on? My... Okay, he's going to have to call back. <laughs> this happens a lot with Skype for some reason. Yeah, it says covered by subscription. Okay, here we go. I should be hearing... There we go. Come on now. That's why I don't keep this thing open. Nobody ever calls anyway. Here we go. Getting closer every second. Oh, for the love of Mike. Hi, and welcome to the Tom Gully Show. You're on the air. Who the hell is Mike? He's the guy that we do things for the love of. Yeah, people wonder why I don't play well with others. I was sitting here listening to all this stuff you'd be saying about me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you had to ask if I paid my phone bill. <laughs> well, you sitting there, you sitting there, all hollering about being monetized and everything. I just wondering, you know. Hey, I know things can get tough sometimes. <laughs> well, you know, I don't open up the. Uh, I I, I got to keep this thing running pretty lean to oh, do I this know, show. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But hey, you know, you got to give me a reason. You know? Yeah. Well, so you I'm know, have fun. You know, hey, you know how. Yeah. The colonel got. Yeah, his... that little that little look out that he has with that mustache and that. Uh, well, it's kind of weird. It, it's it's like a goatee, but it's got that little split where it's like a goatee and a soul patch together. Yeah, it's kind of really weird. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I know how he got that, and who gave it to him? There wow. was a gentleman, a barber. Yeah, don't, don't keep it to yourself. That everybody, that, that, that everybody knows that was my. Uh, you know, my dad was a barber also. Right. This was a person that my dad knew very well. Very well. I mean, I, I mean, you well, can know this person no better. Let's put it like that. Right. Him. He knew but, the guy. Uh, but let's put it like this. But like growing up in Kentucky, up in eastern Kentucky, mm -hmm. you kind of know this. You, you coal miners. Right, and there was two brothers up there who just could not do coal mining. They kind of claustrophobic kind of type people. Right. So those two <laughs> brothers became barbers. Finally, well, one didn't become a barber until after he came out of the military. But there again, the brother though he did it earlier. That was my dad's brother who did that in Cor. He had the barber shop in Corbin, Kentucky. Okay. 
and the colonel would always come in there. And he got him started on that, wearing that little thing, and it went over big. And after he put on that white double-breasted outfit and all that and became the colonel, that was, I mean, if you took that away, there wouldn't be a colonel. But it wouldn't be a KFC. Was, it wouldn't be a Kentucky Fried Chicken, probably. Right, but that was my that was my uncle, though, that gave that to him, my Uncle Earl. I would give a last name, but hell, they'd give my last name. We really don't need that. No. No, hell, then go look it up. I don't really hide it. I mean, it's it's like a famous city in this world, you know. Right. But, uh, you know, but, uh, well, yes, my last name is Berlin. You don't, okay. Uh, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want everybody calling up every wild Bill Istanbul in the whole world. In the whole country, I'm not in Istanbul. I'm not. I'm not in Istanbul tonight. Oh, okay. No, I meant that was your I'm last in, name. I think, I think I'm in. I think I'm in. I think I'm in uh, uh, the UK tonight. I'm I was. Sure. I was saying that. That was your last name, Wild Bill Istanbul. Oh no! I thought you meant to where if you was to try to find me. Well, that wouldn't be easy either. And you track me down, usually you would find my VPN somewhere in Istanbul. That was what, so that's, see, that's really weird. I think somebody, that said that. if they tried to find you, they might be able to come up with a potential location. I don't know as they got closer to where you're at that they could make it through the neighborhood to get to you. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'll tell my. I mean, all they got to do is ask me. I'll tell them I live on Elephant Island, okay? Yeah. And I can even tell them which cave to come to. Aku Mugen asks, is Wild Bill from Sling Blade? Mm -hmm. yeah, like those, mm, like those biscuits from mustard. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Joker says, all, always fun when Wild Bill calls in. Uh, the, the mustache, beard, soul patch, goat looks French. Uh, Dino Bryan says, I just love Wild Bill's chuckle. Um, Peter Lake says, good evening, everybody. How you doing today? Okay. From Peter Lake, Woodhall Spa, Lincolnshire, England. Peter, it was good to see you. Hope the family's doing well. And, uh, mm -hmm. Kahuna says, Reverend mm -hmm. Wild Bill is the goat. That's either greatest of all time, or he thinks that you eat tin cans in your backyard. Well, I will eat anything that don't eat me first, so I don't know. Might be the goat part animal. I don't know. I mean, sometimes you look at my talons coming off called toenails; they might look like a hoof if I yeah. haven't gotten to the if I haven't gotten them trimmed lately. So I, I could be either way. West Bravo, and, and either way, it don't bother me. I don't care. West, <laughs> West Bravo, West Bravo says, I think he wants you to say it ain't got no gas in it. Got no gas in it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Some people call it cosplay. blade. Mm. I call it sling blade. Mm. Angry Snowball yeah. says off key music in the background. This could be a Tom Waits tune. Love this man. Uh, you got some pretty gravy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I. I, I it, it, sometimes it can be aggravating that you, that you call up somebody who shouldn't know your voice and who you are. And the first thing comes out of their mouth, hey, Mr. Bill, how you doing? It's like, well, hold on, wait just a minute now. Yeah. You shouldn't know me like that. It's like you're the only person that has a voice like that. Do you, you know, uh... I've been trying to work on uh, trying to change it, trying so... to come up with something. Yeah. Like, guess what? Like Perry Como or guess what? What? It don't work. Yeah, I imagine not. Did you yeah. my my grandma used to make the most incredible pan fried fried chicken. I was talking to my brother one time and I said I said, yeah, What would yeah. you give? Mm -hmm. What would you give for some of grandma's because she then, she pan fried the fried chicken, which was spectacular with the buttermilk breading and all the stuff she'd do to it. And then she would take the grease from the pan and use it and all the breading that fell off to make the gravy. Spectacular. No, no, it, 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 she wouldn't use all the grease to make the gravy because that's no, no. one greasy gravy. No, but, no, yeah, no. But, uh, yeah, you know, what would I do for some of my granny's chicken? Well, oh, yeah. I'd probably go in there and 
to the kitchen and reach underneath the range and pull out my deep, large cast iron frying pan that's been seasoned. I don't think it's been washed in probably about 30 years now. And uh, it's got all that good cooked on flavor from the past chickens and stuff. I'd probably yeah. go put me some Crisco. I'd probably put me some Crisco in there, fill it about halfway up with Crisco. And then get my chicken and do it the way my granny taught me how to do it. But how my it, mamma taught me how to do it. Well, I could do that too, but, but would it be as good as hers? It wouldn't have her love in it. That would yeah. be the only thing. But otherwise, it'd be just as good. Yeah. Oh, yeah because, mind I mean, mind. I go exactly by what she go. I, I go by exactly the way she would do it. There's just something about. Go with, I mean, there's just, gotta go get a gotta go get a quart of buttermilk. You there's, know? there's just something you gotta, about you gotta how, have buttermilk. Yeah. Well, there's just something about how. But remember those commercials where people would fry chicken and do all sorts of stuff with Crisco. And like only a tablespoon yep. got used, you know. It's like they would pour the Crisco back in because it, it, it only about a quarter of a teaspoon or whatever well, burned it, off. Well, it, it really depends on how good your batter was. The better your batter, the more grease you used. Yeah. Because what they were doing, they were frying up chicken that really didn't have no batter on it, so nothing yeah. could really soak into it. So you were getting your grease back. But I yeah, just, but, I uh, just, I thought that was the dumbest thing to show, even when I was a little kid in the commercial, yeah. you know. And it's like, and, and, and well, that was when they, that, that's when they were I trying know. to get healthy. Now, Tom, they were trying, you know, trying to get away from that stuff. I don't think it Crisco, was you know, being. I don't think it hard. was. No, I don't think it was trying to be healthy. I think they were trying to make it seem super economical. Well, that yeah. might be it too, because that yeah. was during the time too that that a gallon of Crisco would probably cost you what a couple of bucks. Maybe, maybe, because that was back in the '60s, probably. Yeah, it was in the '60s, and they and they used to use Crisco for everything, man. I can remember. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This and then people talk about peanut oil to do stuff. Peanut. Yeah. Oh man, Crisco. Everything you make was your Crisco. biscuits out of Crisco. Yeah, everything. I mean, was you know, you, you say you won't. What do you cook it? I cook it in lard. Yeah, lard. lard? Yeah, Crisco lard. Basically, that's what I cook yeah, it in. Lard. Remember in World War II where they would uh, they would uh, give you meat ration points if you donated your discolored waste grease from your cooking. You could. You, when was this? Oh, it was during World War II. I've got commercials for it. I can. I wasn't. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I mean, if you're talking about commercial, because I was about to say, Tom, hold on. You know I'm old. Well, yeah, I do. But hold on, but just, a, bad, second. Bad, just you, a second. Just a second. Brian okay. Brian Clowder, I want to thank you very very much for your super kind donation yesterday to PayPal.me slash Tom Gully Show. It was really super nice, super cool. I appreciate it. But I've played the commercials on this show before, ladies. Don't throw away your discolored used kitchen grease. Oh, yeah. Remember, you can turn them into your grocer for the manufacturer and because the, they would use those well, for well, lubrication for tanks and whatever else. You know, well, it's it's well, worth that, three, three just, meat. It's worth that. it's worth three meat points. You know. Yeah, but see, not just that too. You also got to remember too, back then during World War Two, that they also had the multi fuel engines. Yeah, that were in the jeeps, the tanks, and stuff like that would would burn. Well, a lot of people don't realize what lard is. Basically, lard they think lard is super super bad. Really, lard is really just coagulated vegetable oil. That's all lard really is. Yeah, I like but, that. But I mean, it's not as bad as what people because a lot of people think it's like fat. You know, we, like fat off meat and lard, you right, know, because it's no. white and everything. But it's not. It's actually just vegetable oil for really yeah. what it is. And we don't get to say coagulated on this show very much, so I appreciate that. Well, that's one of those little five-cent words I thought I'd throw in there, you know. And, Gosh, I, I'm but, you know, so but, tempted. But, but see, I, I, I can't, I, I'm more familiar with the term coagulation in a different respect, and you know what that is. So Blood? You know. There you go. I know of more about it coagulating, you know. But there again, my mind's kind of weird anyway. So, yeah. You know, a lot of people do say that. You right. Know? You got I mean, an idea. Look my, you look around my room here, and it kind of tells on me. You got you, a, you got an idea for tomorrow night's show? <clears throat> Let's see. Tomorrow night's show. Okay. It's Friday night. Yeah. Yeah. You know how I love that. Uh, 
Got to get up at Won't 50 you talk about the, Won't you talk about the old 49th? Um, uh, yeah, running up and down the street in your hot rod and all that kind of stuff. Happy days type stuff. Have you done anything in the 50s, 60s lately? I could do uh, 60s slang terms. I think I've gotten up to the 50s. Yeah, I did the 50s. I could do 60s yeah, slang Yeah, yeah, well, you did do 50s. Right, right. Well. well, you know, you could always do that if you got it up. If not, I mean, you always come up with interesting things. I know. It's a, I mean, let's see. It's uh, a pain in the butt. Okay, you've done Pemberton. Okay. You've done that one. <laughs> <laughs> Aku, we, we Aku, got the, we got the Aku, the chocolates says, running. Aku says, remember when the Jerry's were staring in the trenches, the Yankees had ice cream, an entire barge or the tail gunners would make it fresh. Yeah. <laughs> Aku says, I think I just found one. I don't know what that means. Uh, Dino O'Brien says, we used our, we used to fry our fish and chips in vegetable oil. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ryan Clowder says, I'm going to Uncle Vinny's tomorrow night and we're going to have a blast. So he's going to um, the comedy club, I guess, uh, tomorrow night. So, yes. We, uh, say hi well, you know, say, I, I, say hi to them for the Tom Gully show. We'll be thinking of them. That's right. They're on tour. That's right. Yeah. But, uh, but I was going to tell Diana, yeah, vegetable oil. Yeah, we, we use that a lot over here. But if you go to. If you do, uh, like, go to places like advertise soul food or southern cooking, that kind of stuff. Yeah. A lot of those places, they swear by peanut oil. And that's that's when you walk in down here in the south, you've got to be careful if you've got a peanut allergy because a lot of them have changed away from it. But some of them still are hardcore down here about it. Yeah. And they will still use peanut oil. So you've got to ask them down here, especially if you go to a, like a small family-run cafe. Uh huh. You gotta, you gotta kind of. I said, well, what do you fry your chicken in? Grease. <laughs> well, that sounds good, but what kind? <laughs> well, There's that only one there kind, you are, peanut oil. You peanut know, so. oil and coconut oil got a bad name <laughs> during like the late well, '90s, early 2000s. Well, peanut oil is only bad if you got a nut allergy because, really, they say it makes the chicken taste better. It just depends on which one you're used to because uh, <clears throat> I've had chicken done in peanut oil, and it is really good. It really is. But it just depends on what you've grown up with. And there again, even though Crisco and lard is uh, vegetable, it still tastes different than vegetable oil that you would get off the shelf, you know what I mean? The right. liquid one. Did it you, has a different taste to it. Did you ever But yeah, but you've got but you gotta have a big cast iron pie, pan for that frying pan. Go ahead, did I what? Did you ever have peanut oil in peanut oil? Peanuts and peanut oil, sorry. I put it like this. I I could with what my mama used to get about once a month, I could probably give you a quart of pure peanut oil. Now, the rest of my peanut butter wouldn't be worth a damn, but I could give you a quart of peanut oil because you had to sit there for about an hour almost with a big old wooden spoon or something, sit there and stir that stuff before you could make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> oh, God, that was hell back then. So what you <laughs> did is you just opened up that sleeve of uh, yeah. government cheese and just made you some grilled cheese sandwiches instead and said to hell with that peanut butter. Let yeah. it sit there and let somebody else stir it up. That's stirring that stuff. And you can still get it at the grocery store. They call it natural peanut butter. But it is, it is, uh, boy, is it a chore. Uh, <laughs> let me see a here. Chore. I've got, let me see here. I've got some of this stuff. I'll I, see if I'll I'd find them. i churn butter. Let me play one of them. I found one of them. I, hopefully it's one of the good ones. Uh, cause I got, I don't want to open up a bunch more, uh, stuff here, but this ought to open here in a second. One of my world war two commercials. I just play these all the time on this show. I'm surprised you don't, um, uh, remember. I used to have them on all the time. Hold on a second here. It's opening. I probably, I probably do Tom, but you know, here we go. Here we go. go, over, here, we go. Over here, 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 you know, here, here we go. Oh, that's right. You, okay. you sometimes do some things that make you a little absent-minded. 
Uh, hold on a second. Check this out. It'll just... Every day, as the war against Japan increases in intensity, the need for waste, fats, and greases grows more critical. Here's one department where the enemy may be superior, unless you help make up the difference from your kitchens. Save all waste, fats, and greases, no matter how discolored. Keep a clean can in which to strain them and take them regularly to your butcher. Remember, for every pound, he'll give you four cents plus two extra meat points. Hey, now, that's a deal. I do remember these. That's a deal, I do man. remember, and I do remember you playing them, too, some. I've, yeah, got, I've got probably ten save your grease and donate, them to the, yeah. donate it to the war effort <laughs> commercials. Uh, well, you know, I just I, sometimes I have to have the old noggin jump started. Sometimes, man, me too, me too. Akumugan you know, says, Akumugan says the ice cream of World War II. Angry Snowball says Bill sounds like the guy who could scare off a group with just a sentence, with or without Crisco. Uh, <laughs> Di- Diana Bryan says some shops here used to cook in oil too. Nut oil, she says, used in shops here too once. Aku Mugen says, sent you a video on weaponizing ice cream in World War II. Yeah, well, they weaponized about anything they could. I'll check that out after the show. But anyway, <laughs> any old yeah, way. Sure do. Yeah, you sure do look good with that big with or without Crisco. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> Anyway, I better get out of here. Uh, I got I got to go to sleep and do things. I have well, I better get out before my brain goes somewhere where it shouldn't. So, uh have you that already, Crisco uh, went right there. That Crisco went right there just about did it. Do what? Have, have you and the wife already eaten tonight or is that coming up later? No, we we I, I see it's already 8:30 over yeah, here right now. Yeah, I figured you'd already We eaten. remember we're retired. Yeah. We eat whenever the hell we want to, but usually it's about 4.30. We don't do, well, usually about 4.35. I mean, we do the old folks stuff, you know, about 4.35 o'clock usually. And then we set up until about 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. I get up about 10. She gets up about 3.30. Man, you know, she's the one thought about sleeping so late. So I look, you're retired. You wake up when the hell you want to and go to bed when you want to. Yeah. I mean, she stays in her room, watches her stuff. I'm in the room yeah. where she locks me in, and that's it. They only let me out every once in a while just to go grocery shopping or something like that. Right. But, you know. um, Aku says anyway, Wild, Wild Bill needs a show of reading famous movie lines. And uh, somebody here is asking, does Bill have his own show? You were doing your I own show for to, a while. Yeah. I used to. got to get back on that, man. Well, that's what they say. I, well, I've got one I'm kind of... They asked me to come be with them on the Fridays and yeah, three I, o'clock Eastern time. And I watched a couple of those. And now, now all of a sudden, now they they've been going to a lot of places and stuff, and haven't had it going on. And I've kind of almost said, "Well, look, you want me to just go ahead and run one on a Friday?" But you know, do I really want to do that again? Because I mean, even that guy who had me on before, who actually has. <clears throat> a channel on Roku now that you can actually go to and watch hey, man. a bunch of different stuff. Yeah. He's told me I could come on and do a show again anytime I want to. But the thing is, do I want to? You remember the, the guy that had the Roku channel and I was I on his network? I still got his video. You, you still got his video? If not, I can always send it to you. No, there's a bunch of them I've seen. He's still got all the No, videos. I'm talking videos. about the video. I'm not talking about that video. I'm talking about the poopy bag guy. Oh! See, most of... No, I thought you meant... uh, meant No, I'm not talking about... uh, Oh, I didn't know he had a Roku channel. Yeah, Oh, yeah, he he put... Yeah, yeah, Ranger Rick. He put everybody... Oh, that's Ranger Rob. Ranger Rob, that's it. He put every one of the shows on that network on a Roku channel. I do remember that. It yeah. was sort of a, well, what kind of show was it? It was well, something, that I wouldn't, he, something that I would not frequent. He had all of his stuff on there, you know, all the prepper stuff. He had my show. He had one or two other shows. He had He Said, She Said on there. Which, oh, well, see, I saw his personal show on there, and that was one of those kinds of like, eh, 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 here, here, just one I'd here, watch. Here's my new grill and all that, yeah. Uh, 
I yeah, that, okay. I didn't know he had all the other ones on there. I just knew of you and I knew of him. And... He said, she said was a great show. And I, I, I'll just yeah. go ahead and say it. I was hilarious on that show. That was well, very, I've, very I've watched it, but I didn't know that was part of his stuff. Yeah, that was part yeah, of his that's stuff. That's what I'm saying. Some of these that you're talking about, I knew of and I watched, but I didn't know it was part of him. There's a bunch of people yeah. watching right now that don't remember the days when this show was sponsored by Ranger Rob's Pet Poopy Bags. Pet Poopy Bags. <laughs> <laughs> Every show, I'd get them out and do a live read and show the box and uh, pick up your dog crap, cat crap, goat crap, whatever you got. They're biodegradable. They have them lemon scented. They, uh, I could go through the whole thing again, but yeah, yeah the old gallon in there. So I mean, they were big, huge, and all that. You yeah. almost line a, you could almost line a kitchen <laughs> trash can with them. Yeah, I mean they were. I mean, for what they were, I guess they were good bags. I got a bunch of people that know me to buy them, and my sister swore by them. She had big yeah, old... well, I know that because she would even come on the air and swear by. Well, yeah. you know, in the chat, you know, and swear yeah. by them, but cause, that you got her started on them. And yeah. Stuff, and now she gets them. Yeah. You know, me just call me lazy. I've got a fenced in backyard, and I let Dog go at it. You know, it's yeah. like have fun, boy. Right. Right. Your granddaughter knows to watch out for the landmines. Hey, you know, what can I say? All right, man. Well, it's I'm going gonna, gonna to let you go, and I'm going to get out of here, too, and read up these chats, and we'll do something Well, you know, I night. just wanted to kind of let you know how the colonel got, Colonel Angus got his beard and stuff, you well, know. That's the same way you got yours. <laughs> yeah, let it grow. Yeah, Anyways, exactly. we'll talk at you later. Bye. All right, man. Anytime. Call in anytime. Yeah, right. All right. Bye-bye. That's the always fun Reverend Wild Bill. We just don't get to open the phone lines every show, unfortunately. How was the quality of that call? I gave it a five. Uh, Diane O'Brien from Shrewsbury, Shropshire, over in the UK, says, when we had our chippy, a man came around for our filter dial, took the batteries away to convert the soap, makeup, etc. True. It, very True. Uh, Gilman says, please do a deep dive on Bill Monroe, the founder of Bluegrass Music, legendary jerk, Bluegrass Stamp, just released. Okay, Bill Monroe. I'll tell you what, just for you, Gilman, uh, I am writing it down. I'm scrawling it because I don't, I'm not trying to write it very well. And there, well, well, let's put a line through this other one here so I know it's done. I have inscribed it on this. I've marked out pervitine and put Bill Monroe. Oh, come on, man. Come on. Come on. What is this stupid green screen always hoses me? Uh, let's see. There we go. That's just proof for you there. All right. Uh, Tyler Schulmer says, I remember that. I also remember the days of a certain horror host network on Facebook who since disappeared. Um, yeah, when I was on the, um, was it Chalk? Chalk? Chop Block Network. I, I was on so I was on Ironic Chop Block. Uh, of course, Sonic Asylum. Um, what else was I on? I was on like five networks at one point in time. And Chop Block, the guy who did that, he went full on gaming for some reason, and all the horror people left. And uh, Wild Bill and I have a video of him that is so bizarre I can't describe it Bill can try but it would creep you out for the rest of your days somebody sent it to us we also have another video that we just plain old can't talk about <laughs> that we were just talking about almost uh, Aku said Bob Levy would love a box of those oh god he'd really love a box of Bill Monroe is my favorite Lester Flats too Earl Scruggs sure Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys. Ah ha! Deep within my heart lies a melody. The song of old San Antonio. San Antonio. It used to be his Texas Doughboys or the Playwright Doughboys or something. Anyway, I think that's probably going to put a cork in it for this one. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Like, share, subscribe, retweet. Doesn't cost you a penny. PayPal.me slash Tom Gully Show. And um, really appreciate those donations. Brian Clowder and or his wife last night did. 
and every little bit helps. Reverend Wild Bill says, PBDC, I do remember that. The something bunny, I can't remember exactly what I, if I looked it up, I could. But we do have a video from those people. No, it's not video, it's a picture. It's just a picture. But the guy who ran Chop Block, we actually have a video of him dancing and prancing in a state of attire. Whoa. Anyway, look, I'll come up with something by tomorrow night. I don't know what, but I'll come up with something and uh, we'll do a show for you. I uh, hope you've enjoyed our little visit with Colonel Harlan Sanders and uh, oh, Psycho Bunny Death Cult. I know. Yeah, let's see. Uh, well, we'll I'll, I'll show those during the outro. Um, I guess the only thing left to say is, till next time, we'll see you next time. Right out of my pants